Well, welcome to session 13. Congratulations for getting through the senior project session, and even bigger congratulations for deciding to stick around to tackle the extra advanced sort of graduate school topics. Today, we're going to cover some additional advanced features in IPOS. Some of these are definitely a little unusual. You probably won't use them very often, but when you need to use them, they're great tools. So we're going to take a look at these. We're going to begin by learning about a new kind of variable. Now, if you think way, way back to when I introduced variables, I said that IPOS really just had one data type, which we called long. It was a 32-bit signed integer variable, essentially a number. Well, that is certainly true, but IPOS does have a second kind of variable that's available and a second data type that goes with it, and it is something called a record. Now, you may wonder why didn't I talk about this earlier? Well, first of all, it's not a simple data type or simple variable. It's actually a very sophisticated one. It's really in a different category, and it's also only used for some advanced topics. So let's talk about record variables. A record is a group of variables stored contiguously in memory and accessed by a common name. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you a picture. I think this will be clearer. Think of a record sort of like an index card, and that index card has a name written in the upper left corner. That is the name of the index card, or actually the name of the record. In this particular case, it's called table row 1. Now that index card has different kinds of information written on it below the title. For example, it may have four sections labeled position, speed, ramp up, and ramp down. These are the variables contained within the record. So the overall name of the record variable is table row 1, but it contains four variables grouped together called position, speed, ramp up, and ramp down, and they are physically stored in data memory in locations H128, 129, 130, and 131. So here's kind of the summary of the whole thing. We have the record name here. We have the individual variables that make it up. And then we have the individual variable names. So that is really what a record variable is. It's really a method of grouping together related information under a common name. As I'm sure you can guess, you really don't have to have something like this to write effective programs. We've been getting along just fine without them so far. But if you are writing sophisticated programs, sort of like the one you just wrote for the senior project, you can kind of see how record variables could actually be useful because you're grouping together related information. Just a little FYI, records are also known by programmers as complex variables or structure variables. So be aware of that. If you're chatting with other programmers, you might hear those terms come up. All right, so here we have two record variables. The first is called table row one, and the second is called table row two. They contain four individual variables within them, and you can also see the data memory locations that they occupy. Now let's tackle a few important questions about these. First of all, how do you access the individual variables within a record variable? Say you wanna change position or speed or one of the ramp variables, how do you do it? You do it something like this. You take the name of the record you're interested in, you put a period, a dot, after it, and then you put the individual variable name after the period. Now there are no spaces whatsoever in here. This is just all mushed together. You then put an equal sign and whatever you want to put in there. So if you want to set, for example, table two ramp up to 1500, you say table row two, dot ramp up equals 1500, and that accesses the record variable, the individual variable, and then puts the value into it. So if you then went and looked in H134, you should see 1500 in there. That is how you work with the individual variables inside record variables. 
You can also work with the record as a single unit, however, and this is the real power of record variables. You could say, for example, table row 1 equals table row 2. And what that will do is it will copy every single thing from table row 2 into the variables that match it in table row 1. Let me just give you a quick little caution. If you're going to do this, though, you better be sure that those two variables are from the same data type because you can have different kinds of record variables that have different numbers of individual variables within them. And if they don't match and you try to do an assignment like this, that is not good. In this case, you can tell just by looking at them the table row 1 and 2 are the same type. They each have four variables and they have the same names within them. So how do you create a record variable? Well, you do this in your program almost the same way you create a simple variable. We have been creating a lot of simple variables as we go along, and we usually do it something like this. We say long motor position. Long, as you know, is the simple data type. It's the only data type in IPOS, the 32-bit signed integer. And then you give a variable name after that, and that's really a simple variable name. It's a variable designed to hold just one chunk of data, in this case, a number. We create record variables almost in exactly the same way. We do it in the same part of our program near the beginning. The difference is when you create a record variable that you have to use a complex data type name instead. And in this case, here's one called move link. This is a complex data type. It's actually one built into IPOS. It's already defined and it contains seven variables within it. It's also all uppercase. The ones that are predefined in IPOS are all uppercase. So you use that instead of long. So that clues IPOS that you're not doing a simple data type variable. You're doing a complex data type variable. And then you put a name right after it in just the same way. And this is the record variable name. And you can name it whatever you like using the same conventions that you've become used to. And you would do this at the beginning of your program in the same place you're defining your simple variables. That is how you create a record variable. It's really straightforward. Now let's talk about the data types that are built into IPOS, specifically the complex data types. We know about the one and only simple data type already, but here are the complex ones. And you say, oh dear, look at all those. Are we gonna learn about them all? The answer is no, we're not. A lot of these do very specialized things that are beyond the scope of this class. We're going to look at just two of these that do some very useful things that you might actually want to do on a regular basis. I'm just going to mention that all the built-in complex data types are uppercase. I've said that once, I'll say it again. It's just the way you kind of clue yourself in that this is a built-in IPOS complex data type. The two that we're going to play with are the ones I've highlighted in red, MoveLink and MLData. All the others are for you to explore on your own or possibly for an advanced class down the road. So those are the built-in data types. What if you want to create your own? Can you create your own record data type, for example? Maybe you think back to your senior project and you say, you know, I really could have used the record variable type. And the answer is, well, yeah, you certainly can create your own complex data types. Here's how you do it. First of all, you do this near the beginning of your program where you're creating variables. And your first step is to define the record structure and give it a name. In other words, you're creating really the data type, not the variables. And here's how you do it. You use the keyword type def struct. Remember I said these are called structure variables. So what you're doing is you're building a structure. So you use type def struct and you have a pair of curly braces after it. And inside the curly braces, you set up the individual variables that make up the record. So maybe you're going to create something like that table row record that I showed you a few slides ago. It has four variables inside it, position, speed, ramp up, and ramp down. In this case, they're simple variables. Remember, long is our only simple data type. So you just say long position, long speed, long ramp up, long ramp down, semicolons after every one of those. And then you cap it off by giving the record itself a name right outside the closing curly brace. In this case, we'll call it table record. 
and you end it with a semicolon. That creates the structure. Now that has not actually created any variables yet. That's only defined the structure and given the record a name. Let me mention just as an aside, it's generally considered a good idea not to use all uppercase for your custom complex data types. That's so we don't confuse them with the built-in ones in IPOS. So usually when I create my own programs, I make mine all lowercase and that differentiates them. So now we have to create the variables from the new data type. We do it in the very familiar way. We use the name of the complex data type, which in this case is table record, and then we create individual variables. And I've created three here. Of course, you can create as many as you like. You could just create one. You could create 10. It's up to you. In this case, I've called them row one, two, and three. I end it with a semicolon. And then you access those variables in the normal way. So you could do things like this. You could say row one dot position equals 5,000. Row one dot speed is 10,000. Or you could assign one table variable to another. You could say row two equals row three, and that will copy everything from it. Pretty normal. Just do what you've been doing, but in a little more complicated way. Okay, good. Time to learn another IPOS function. This is one of the 32 built-in functions. This one's going to use some of the complex data types. This function is a little weird because it communicates, but it communicates in such a diversity of ways it, it seems a little strange. Let me explain by introducing it. It's called MovieLink, and it's used for VFD communications. You may have heard the term MovieLink before when we've talked about the MovieDrive B. MovieLink is its communication protocol often used for communicating between multiple VFDs that are networked together, either over a field bus or RS-485 or something like that. So you might be inclined to think, okay, this makes sense. This is for VFD to VFD communications. And the answer is, yes, it certainly is, but it's more than that. This versatile function can not only communicate across the S bus or RS-485, can actually communicate internally within the VFD as well. And that's kind of what makes this function a little weird to my mind. I would have expected that the people who designed the IPOS programming system would have created a separate function for internal communications, but maybe they just thought, well, communication's really communication, so let's just bundle it all together. Who knows? Decision was made a long time ago. Doesn't really matter now. Internal communications means something very important. It means you can read and write the entire parameter tree. Now, we have already learned one built-in function that can access specific parameters, setsys. We use that to change things like positioning, speed, and ramps. Well, the MovieLink function can access the complete parameter tree. You can change every single parameter under program control. And that is extremely useful because a program can set its own parameters rather than making the user go in and manually do it before running the program. In fact, in some ways, this is a smarter way of approaching a program because it's more bulletproof. It ensures that everything gets set exactly the right way. You may wonder, well, why do we need a function like setsys, which can only access a few parameters? Why don't we just always use MovieLink? The answer is setsys allows you to set parameters very simply with just a few lines of code. Setting up a MovieLink communications is much more complicated, and so I think they decided they would let you do the most common things using a simplified function and the more sophisticated things using this one. At least that's my take on it. You can also do something else. This is really sophisticated, and you probably wouldn't do it very often but you can actually change the parameters on a different VFD if it's networked to the one that your program is running in. So you could sort of have a master VFD that could write the parameters in other VFDs that it's networked to. That's really interesting and probably very specialized. Let me say though that when you start doing things like this, be very careful. If you change parameters in the wrong way, you can really mess up big time. So it's important to know what you're doing. As I said, this is an advanced session. We're dealing with fairly advanced topics. One other thing this function can do, of course, is to pass data back and forth between multiple VFDs if they're networked together. 
and that can be very useful, especially in sophisticated applications where there are several VFDs controlling several motors in a coordinated way. You can do some very customized things with this, but we're not going to cover that in this class. That's like a super advanced topic. Now, the MoviLink function relies on two complex data types built into IPOS. So these are the two complex data types used. The first is called MovLink. This creates records containing seven individual variables. And what these do is configure the communications. So you have to set this up before calling the MoviLink function. Then there's a second data type, creates a second record variable, and it is called MLData. Data is passed back and forth through the ML data records, which contain eight individual variables. So, MovLink records configure the communications, ML data records pass the actual data back and forth. You always use these together. Now, what we're going to do in this session is we're going to focus on looking within the VFD, reading and writing the parameters. The reason I'm doing this, you might not actually have two Movi Drive Bs networked together to play with. And in a class, it would be very impractical to give every student two VFDs to play with. So we're going to work internally. But most of the things you learn communicating internally would apply to communicating between VFDs. So this is broadly useful. And as I've said, reading and writing your own parameters is something you'll do fairly often Communicating between VFDs may be something you never do, depending what your job is. So let's look how to do this. First, we need to look at the MovLink complex data type to know what goes on inside it. So this is a record variable called MLVAR1. It's of the data type MovLink, and it contains the following variables within it. The first is called bus type. And if you are doing internal communications, you set this to a constant that's already defined in const b.h, which you always include, of course. You pass it the constant mlbts1. And that says use the RS-485 interface number two, which is used for internal communications in this case. Then the next variable within it is called address. This is the RS-485 address you're communicating to. And you give it 253, which is your own address. That makes you look internally. If you were communicating with another Movi drive, you would give whatever its RS-485 address is. But in this case, you use 253. Then you have another variable called format. And in this case, we give it the constant MLFT par, which means we are only working with parameters. The next one is called service, and we pass it one of three parameters depending what we're doing. We use MLSRD if we're reading a parameter, MLSWR if we're writing a non-volatile parameter, and MLSWRV if we're writing a normal parameter, which is the one we'll probably use most of the time. Then there is a variable called index, and we have to give it the parameter's index number. I will show you how to find that out. That's a fairly large number, and every single thing in a Mobi Drive B has its own individual index number. I'll show you how to find these, and you pass it in. And then lastly, you have to pass it something called dpointer, and what this does, it's a link to an ML data record variable, the one that's going to send or receive the information that we're transacting. I'll show you how to do that as well. Yes, this looks a little complicated, and if this confuses you, you may want to watch this video twice to really understand it. But once you get in the groove, it's actually pretty easy. And then the very last variable inside is called result. That returns an error code, basically tells you if the communication succeeded or failed. Now, there are many other predefined constants that are used for other types of communications, and I'll leave those as an exercise for the ambitious student who wants to dig into the IPOS manual and learn how this works. The second record variable is of the complex data type ML data. This is the record where the data comes in or out. So here we've created a record variable called MLVAR2. It contains eight individual variables, and here they are. The first is called write par. That is the value that you put into the parameter if you're writing one. 
The second one is read par. If you're reading out of a parameter, this is where the value comes back from that parameter. Then you have three variables called PO1, 2, and 3. These are only used when you're sending data to a separate VFD. These are called process output words. And there's three process input words called PI1, PI2, and PI3. The PO, PI words are only used for VFD to VFD communications, so we are not using them for what we're doing here. But they're in there, so you should know that they exist. Now, let's come back to that topic that I just mentioned, index addressing. How do you find the index of something you want to read or write? IPOS-capable products use an indexing system to identify parameters, variables, and other internal information. Almost everything in the Mobi Drive B has an index. You need to know the item of interest index number if you wish to access it. Now, you can use MovLink to interact with the variables. I'm not sure why you'd want to, since you can interact with them directly, but they have index numbers. It is simply the H number plus 11,000. So for example, H128's index number is 11,128. All right, that's interesting, but how do you find parameter index numbers? Well, there's an easy way. You go into the parameter tree and you just hover over the parameter you care about. So for example, if you wanna find out parameter 903's index, the reference travel type, hover over it. This little box pops up and look, there's the index number. 8,626, that's the index number right there. So use the hover function, write it down, use it in your program, you're good to go. All right, we are getting there. I know this is heavy stuff, but we're getting to the goal and that is how to read and write parameters. So what you have to do is this in your program, you have to create two record variables, one of data type MoveLink and the other of data type ML data. I've just called mine mlvar1 and mlvar2. So this is up in the variables and constants section. Secondly, you have to set up the first record variable with this information. You set up bus type to mlbts1. Remember, that's a built-in constant. You set the address to 253. The format to mlftpar. If you are reading the parameter, you set service to MLSRD. You then set the index number to the parameter that you're accessing. In this case, it's parameter 903s. You then link it to the second record variable, MLVAR2, and you do that using a function called numOf and then the variable name in parentheses. Then finally, you execute the MovieLink function and you pass it MLVAR1. That would read a parameter. So it would take quite a few steps, but in the end, that would do the job. If you want to write a parameter, you do almost exactly the same thing, but you have to do one extra step. Notice that bus type, address, and format are the same, but service is different. It's MLSWRV. That's saying you want to write a parameter. This is a volatile one. Index number is the same. D pointer is set up the same way, but there is one extra variable, and that one you have to set up in ML data, and that is the value you want to write. So in mlvar2.writepar, you give it whatever the value is you want to change it to. In this case, we're changing the referencing mode from 1 to 8. So we put an 8 in there, and then you call MovieLink and you pass it mlvar1, and that will write that parameter. Okay, pretty straightforward. Lots of lines, but not that hard. And don't forget, when you're linking the two record variables together, you've got to use that numOf function. That passes the information that IPOS needs to connect the one to the other. All right, well, it's time to write a program. I'm going to create a brand new program called Program 15. This is totally new. It's not using any of the old ones, so you probably want to just start with kind of your skeleton program again. Here's what you're doing. In the initialization section of main, set the following parameters to these values. Set P160 to 250 RPM, P161 to 750, P162 to 1000. Set P130 and 131 to 500 milliseconds. Those are ramp values. Set P132 and 133 to 1000 milliseconds. Then, 
read parameter 901 and store it in a variable called ref speed 1. Read parameter 902 and store it in a variable called ref speed 2. And then finally, using movie tools and the variable watch function, confirm that ref speed 1 and ref speed 2 contain the right values. And then you probably also want to go through the parameter tree in movie tools and make sure that 160, 161, 162, 130, 131, 132, and 133 all change to what you told them to change to. And that is it. Go ahead and pause the video and do it. Well, I hope that wasn't too painful and you found it interesting how to access the Movie Drive B's parameter tree through your program. So let's go ahead and compare your code to mine and you can see how things worked. Okay, well, here is my program. As I said before, this program has nothing in common with the previous one, so I started with an empty skeleton program. Let's just go through it very quickly and see how it works. All right, the first thing I had to do is create my two complex data type record variables. So I declared them as mlvar1 and var2. I used the data type movelink for the first and mldata for the second. They're both capitalized. This signals that they're both built-in complex data types that are predefined in IPOS. Now I need two long variables just to receive those speeds that I'm retrieving from parameters. So I go down here and I just declare two longs. These are just ordinary variables. Pretty straightforward. Now we get into our main function and I told you to do this in the initialization section. So we're just doing it once. So notice all of this comes outside the while loop. In fact, if you look here, here's the while loop and there's nothing in it. Once the program completes the initialization, it just sits here and loops endlessly and doesn't do anything further. All right, let's look how we set all this up just to make sure you understand it. We need to, first of all, set up all the individual variables inside mlvar1. We need to set it up to write some parameters and then read some parameters. So here's what we do. The first thing we do is we set the first four variables. We set bus type to MLBTS1, which means pick the internal access through RS-485 interface number two. I set the address to 253, which is myself. I set the format to FTPAR, which means access the parameters. And since we're going to write four parameters first, I set service to MLSWRV. That's not going to change for any of the operations that we do initially. Then I need to set the index of the parameter. I'm supposed to write a whole series of parameters, 160, 161, and 162, and then 130 and 131, 132 and 133. Let's actually go to the parameter tree because we need to get the index numbers of all these parameters. So I go to the parameter tree here, and you can see that 160, 161, and 162 are the internal fixed set points. These are sometimes used in terminal control mode. You notice they're set right now to 300, 600, and 900 RPM. So if we succeed, these should change. Notice they go down to a tenth of an RPM. So let's get the index numbers. You just hover over it. And there's the index number right there. It's 8,489 for this one, 8,490 for the second, and 8,491 for the third. Those are the index numbers. I also had to change 130, 131, 132, and 133. These are ramp values. We can see these are set to 1500, 1500, 2500, and 2500 milliseconds. Of course, I'll hover over these to get their index numbers as well. There's the index number 8470, 8471, 8472, and 8473. I'm going to change those as well. Okay, so I've recorded my index numbers. So you notice I set the index number to the first parameter, parameter 160. 
Then I have to set the pointer, which links the two record variables together. So I do this. I set mlvar1.dpointer to the result from the function num of mlvar2. Remember, the num of function performs that connection. And this is put in the second record variable, mlvar2. So I set mlvar2.writepar to 2500. I'm making an assumption here, since most of the RPM values I've been setting through IPOS functions seem to go down to a tenth of an RPM. I'm assuming one pseudo decimal place, so I put in 2500. And then finally, I'm ready to write the parameter, so I call the MovieLink function, passing it mlvar1. That should do the trick to make that change. Then I go on to change the other parameters. Notice I don't have to set up everything all over again. I just have to change things that need to be altered. So I set the index number to the next parameter. Then I set write par in mlvar2 to the new value. Then I call the function. So I do that for parameter 161, 162, 130, 131, 132, and 133. And now we're going to go and read two parameters into those two long variables. Again, I only change the things I have to change. So what I do here first is I change the service from write to read, so I alter the constant here. And now I've got to, of course, go and look at the parameter tree again to get index numbers. So I'm after 901 and 902. Let's find those. 901 is the referencing speed number 1. It's currently set to 360 RPM. Reference speed number 2 is set to 60. I'm going to hover here, get my index 8624 and 8625. I set my index numbers. Again, I call MovieLink, and then I transfer the record variable mlvar2.readpar into ref speed and that should retrieve that parameter into my variable. I do the same thing again for the next parameter. And that's it. So let's compile this and see if it works. So I just run it, and that should be it. It should have just done it almost instantly. So let's go back to the parameter tree. Let's take a look at our parameters, and uh-oh, something definitely didn't work. 160 is set to 2.6 RPM. 161, 7.6, 162 to 10.0. Our speeds, for some reason, are very below what they were supposed to be. But you can see the digits that are in there look sort of right. It's more like they're just too small. It appears, therefore, that we actually have to pass in more pseudo decimal places to make this work. That's a little confusing since you can only set the RPM down to a tenth in the parameter tree. I'm not sure why IPOS does it this way. Maybe it has a higher internal precision than it's actually allowed to use, but it looks like I have to set this to bigger numbers in order to make these change. Let's take a look at those ramps and make sure they're okay first though before we change our code. All right, and the ramps are just fine. So I have 130 and 131 to half a second, that is 500 milliseconds. 132 and 133 is to one second each, therefore that's 1,000 milliseconds. So clearly there are no extra decimal places there. Let's check one thing, though, before we change our code. Let's go back and bring up the all variables window and take a look and see if we retrieved those two speed parameters successfully. We've got to hunt through the variables, find our two longs. They'll be down in the 400s. There they are. There's ref speed one and two. And notice that we've retrieved the parameters successfully, 360 RPM and 60. But notice there are three pseudo decimal places. Apparently, that is how IPOS internally stores speeds. So what we need to do is add two more decimal places to our parameters that we were writing, and that should fix it. By the way, if you're ever not sure how a parameter is formatted internally, if you do a retrieve like this, that can kind of clue you in. So just by looking at this, I've been able to show myself that we need three internal decimal places. Okay, so let's stop the program, and we're just going to fix this by adding two more decimal places 
to each of these speeds, recompile our code, run it, and go to the parameter tree again. And there we go. We now have 250 RPM, 750, and 1000. Everything clearly has been set correctly, so we seem to have cracked our problem. Okay. Hopefully that all made sense. You can see that it does take a certain amount of code to access the parameter tree, but it's not that onerous once you get in the groove. And that is the end of session 13, so congratulations on completing another advanced session. We have just one final session. It deals with field bus communication, so yes, it's an advanced topic too. So maybe you want to take a good long break before diving into that, but be of good cheer. We are coming to the end very quickly. See you next time.